So last video, we looked at meiosis um, and we talked about some processes that we didn't get time to work through, such as uh, crossing over, random assortment, that sort of thing. These are the processes that generate the genetic variation that we see within meiosis. So if we just go back now to our syllabus objectives and what we need to learn, we looked at the role of homologous chromosomes and we talked about um, the general processes that uh, we, we see within meiosis. We didn't talk about the processes that actually relate to genetic variation, the crossing over, recombination, independent assortment, and random fertilization. These four processes are what leads to genetic variation in our offspring. That's what makes offspring being so completely genetically different to uh, their parents. So what we're gonna go through today in this video is looking at these processes and looking at, well, how do they lead to genetic variation? Um, before we do that though, the end product of meiosis is gamete production. So we've got these sex cells now that we can use to undergo sexual reproduction. If you're a female or if you uh, possess ovaries, then you're going to undergo uh, oogenesis, which produces ovum. Now, uh, this process happens via meiosis. And for women, or for people with ovaries, I should say, this process happens before they're even born, when they're still in utero, or at least it starts then. The primary oocytes, which you can see are made there, uh, they then basically start the process, they're partly cooked, and then they stall. Until each month, an oocyte undergoes meiosis one, and then meiosis two, and is ovulated, which produces an egg each uh, month, each menstrual cycle. This also produces polar um, bodies as well. So as meiosis one undergoes, instead of producing two of our, um, of our secondary oocytes, we end up producing one and a polar body, which then goes off, dies and disintegrates. If the egg is then fertilized, it will undergo meiosis two um, and produce a haploid ovum and a polar body as well. And then because it's fertilized, it will mature into an egg. So from one diploid cell originally, the end result is only one haploid sex cell or one ovum. And that only happens all the way through uh, if it is fertilized. For spermatogenesis happening with people with testes, this process uh, is a lot more basic, okay? and constant. So the process starts with stem cells in the testes and is constantly happening every day. Men are capable of producing 3 million sperm a day, which is significant. The uh, primary spermatocyte undergoes two divisions, meiosis one, meiosis two, and the result is four spermatids, uh, which will all mature into sperm cells in the epididymis. So that process is a lot simpler. For females, Oogenesis takes one um, oogenum, oogonium, sorry, I think it's pronounced, and which is uh, 2N and then produces one haploid da uh, daughter ovum, whereas spermatogenesis takes one diploid spermatogonum and produces four mature sperm. And there's some differences there. Okay, main differences uh, being that the uh, oogenesis produces one instead of four resulting cells. Um, number two, once puberty is reached, men are producing sperm all the time, whereas ovaries only contain a limited amount of cells. I think typically it's around the 400 mark, which if you take into account, uh, someone would typically reach puberty and start menstruating around the age of 13. You have one a month. Um, each year, so that's 12 every year, you know, ignoring some times when you might get, uh, might end up getting pregnant and that puts a nine to 10 month pause on things and other pauses there. It does give you until about your 45 or 50, uh, before you'll run out of eggs. And that's when menopause occurs. 
Whereas men just keep on trucking their whole life. Fertilization is one of the points where we get this genetic variation. As mentioned earlier, uh, fertilization creates genetic variation in a very simple way in that you uh, can take two gametes, which have half of their parents' DNA, randomly allocated half. So you don't get to pick which half. Randomly allocated half of your parents' DNA come together to create a diploid cell, okay? It's mixing. It's like you have two Lego cars and you pull them apart to make one new car, okay? It's not. It's gonna have some aspects of the other car, of the first two cars, but it's not gonna be identical. Each gamete is contributing 22 of our autosomes, our, um, our non-sex chromosomes, and then one sex chromosome. Ova can only contribute Xs, while sperm can only produce Ys or Xs uh, to produce. So as we said, the sperm are making the decision about the biological sex. There's a 50-50 chance every single time for the zygote, uh, resulting zygote, which is a fertilized egg, okay, an egg and a sperm together, 50-50 chance it'll be male or female. 50-50 chance every single time, no exceptions. There's no uh, examples of people when they're like, oh no, girls run in my family. Or, well, if you have sex you know, whilst facing east and chewing on lemons under a full moon, then you're going to produce a female. None of that is real. It's all just random patterns because at the end of the day, it's 50% chance every time. Now we're moving into where things start to get different. Okay, those processes we talked about before, crossing over and recombination. That's basically uh, one process altogether. So when we talked earlier in prophase one, where those homologous chromosomes get together, they get a little funky, they give each other a really special cuddle where they stick together, forming a bivalent or tetrad. Um, and they stick together at those points known as chiasmata. What happens is that these chiasmata can effectively switch sections. And that process is known as crossing over because we have sections or, or genes moving from one homologous chromosome to the other. So we look at this process here. Um, when the homologous chromosomes are attached, they can swap those sections of DNA, which mixes up the original. If we look at the blue one here, we can say that that's daddy's DNA and the red is mum's DNA. Now, if you were to just take half of that and put it into a gamete, then you've got basically daddy's DNA. But what actually happens is, is not that simple. When they connect together at that chiasmata, which you can see in the second image there, they can swap legs. They can swap sections of their genes. And when they swap sections of their genes and then undergo recombination, we have now these two um, chroma these two homologous chromosomes, each made up of two sister chromatids, that now potentially have completely new combinations. Now, if we look at our sister chromatids here, we have uh, this first this first one here is still completely original. Okay, this one here is still completely original. But then we look at this inside left one here, which now has a brand new combination, as does the inside right. So these inside ones are our recombinant chromatids, whereas the outside are non-recombinant chromatids. So crossing over here has occurred as they attached at the chiasmata, swapped those genes, and then underwent recombination. So looking here, we can see this uh, effectively shown again. You've got duplicated homologous pair, two homologous chromosomes, each with two sister chromatids. The duplicated holomogs cross over. They have that little cuddle, form a chiasmata, and they can break and then reattach or recombine their new um, sections. The end result is we have new pairs with different combinations. Okay, so we can see all our new DNA going on there. So, so far we've seen that fertilization can result in genetic variation because there's a random, random set of your genes going into every egg or sperm. Crossing over also creates these completely new forms of um, chromatids that we haven't seen before. 
And so that's also creating huge genetic diversity. Then we've got a couple of other processes as well. Independent assortment and random fertilization. So during metaphase, the homologous pairs line up along their equator. We already know this in metaphase one, but they don't all line up in the same way. It's completely random. They assort themselves independently, if you will. So that means that we don't end up with all the maternal um, chromosomes on the left and all the paternal on the right. Uh, it's completely random. So we'll end up with a, a mix of those. That means that during anaphase one, where they're pulled away to the poles, the assortment of chromosomes that end up at each end is totally random. Uh, instead of ending up with one end being all daddy's DNA and the other end being all mom's. Okay. Um, so you can see that process illustrated here. If you look at the different colors, we've also got some little codes there as well to help you show how that uh, process happens. But what that means is that independent assortment means that all haploid cells, those gametes that we're producing are a mixture of maternal and paternal genes. And the result of this, the total number of, of combinations is two to the power of 23, which is 8,388,608. If independent assortment was the only thing resulting in genetic diversity for uh, in reproduction, that is still a remarkable amount of variation. Uh, and that can account for why, you know, we can have so much difference between offspring and parents. So, so far we had crossing over, creating completely new uh, chromosomes or arrangements of chromosomes, I should say, and that creates genetic diversity. Then we have independent assortment coming in, and that means that we have another possible over 8 million uh, arrangements of those uh, chromosomes. And lastly, random fertilization. Random fertilization, as we said, each one of those gametes can have a possible 8 million more combinations. Then we're crossing over as well and our recombination, all of this, and then the fact that any random sperm could fertilize any random egg the result of this is an enormous amount of genetic variation through the meiosis process. So we have crossing over and recombination, independent assortment and random fertilization, all of which are contributing to this enormous amount of genetic variation. And that's why you might look very different from everyone else in your family. I've got a twin brother and we look very different thanks to these processes, because we're fraternal, of course.